Hi, friends. Welcome to Episode 77 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian finishing my 13th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, by my interview guests, and the listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast is something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Kelsey in Louisiana, Courtney in Nebraska, and I really enjoyed connecting with Tara in Tennessee this week. You may have heard my interview with Tara in our episode, The Future of Our Biography Section. Like many of you who follow my interview guests, I consider past guests part of my PLN, and I asked Tara if I could share something she said. She said, quote, I truly view your podcast like Target. I go in for one thing, and I come out with so much more, end quote. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback, questions, and episode suggestions, either on Facebook, Twitter, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a sticker. Before I get started with today's interview, I wanted to share something. I love using this platform to share strategies and resources for school librarians. Occasionally, these episodes share perspectives and messaging we might otherwise not hear. Last week's episode, Hashtag Good Trouble and Advocacy, and my interview with Casey Boyd was an example of this messaging. In light of this week's protests around the country responding to the death of George Floyd while in police custody in Minneapolis, I would like to encourage listeners who have not already heard my interview with Casey to tune in. Casey addressed microaggressions and the uncomfortable conversations and personal reflection which needs to happen in all of us. I am proud to broadcast episodes which give us all an opportunity to consider the assumptions we hold and the importance of the words we use. And I hope to continue to do so in the future. And now for today's episode, Virtual Culture of Reading, and my interview with Melissa Tom. Listeners, I am so excited to be bringing to you conversation I am sharing with Melissa Tom. And if you haven't, I recommend you listen to Melissa's first episode, which aired in December of last year, episode number 52, titled School-Wide Culture of Reading. It has been incredibly well-received and downloaded in at least 49 states, last time I checked, and in over 30 countries around the world. So, Melissa, I, I have to say, the last time you and I talked was before before Thanksgiving, and it seems like uh, uh, ages ago. Uh, you know, how had your year been going before, like March thirteenth? Wow. Well, thank you first of all for having me back. I am very, very happy to be speaking with you again. And I am—I can't even really, really believe that March was so long ago. Yet it seems so recent. It's just been crazy. Um, these last four months, but we were having a great year in my middle school and we were getting a lot of synergy. And I had that first week of March, we had an amazing author event um, with Leslie Connor, who is, we were one of her first groups that she got to share a home for goddesses and dogs with. And we had uh, library lunch groups meeting every week and we were doing lots of book talking and we were getting, um, kind of ramped up to start really talking about our nutmeg nominees, getting ready for voting coming up in, you know, a month in April. And, and then everything just kind of came to a screeching halt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it did. And it, it's, uh, it, it, it's even stranger. Have you had an opportunity to go back to your library since you've closed? Um, I have been allowed in twice for short visits. And I have to say the first time it was like supermarket shopping spree. It was in 
insane. And I was so excited to be able to get my hands on some of the books that I had had and that had been ordered. And just recently it arrived right before we stopped going to, to physical school. So, and, and then I was able to go back just a couple of weeks ago and, and grab some more things. So, but only twice. And it's, it's, I miss it. I miss it, it a lot. Yeah, it's very eerie, like time stood still. All right. So I follow you on social media and I, I noticed that, um, you joined the, the, the throng of, of very talented people who know how to use sewing machines in creating masks. And I don't know where you find the time to do this, but you seem incredibly motivated. And I was wondering if you wanted to share. Oh yeah. Um, so Back actually in December, I really started to kind of pick up my um, literacy inspired crafting is what I have called it. And I, I use that hashtag whenever I post things on my Twitter feed or Instagram. And what I had started doing back in December was I really wanted to connect books with um, just some of my passion for crafting and maker space. And so I was making bags out of fabric paint and stencils based on books that I was loving, taking some of their golden lines, my favorite quotes and, and putting them on there and then matching that with the book that it went with, and then either a pillow or a blanket. And I had been doing fleece blankets for the last few years as a make a difference project in my maker space in my middle school. And so it, that was kind of my own personal at home maker space activity that I had been doing. And so when this all happened, I started you know, seeing kind of a shift in, you know, people aren't as focused on the blankets and the pillows, but now masks are becoming this, this unfortunate, necessary evil that we need to wear. Um, so I thought, well, how can I bring a little bit of book love and joy to that aspect of our, our life for the, you know, the indetermined future. And so I stopped making the blankets and the pillows so much, and I moved over to cotton and started making masks. Um, and it all kind of goes into this whole thing where I've been trying to uh, send book mail to students and teachers and just friends all over the country because I know libraries are closed, both public and school libraries, um, and people are having a really hard time getting access to to reading material and books. So um, I started to promote some of my masks, and then I will send a book along with a mask that kind of accompanies it. And using any profits that I make, I don't make much profit. I basically put in, you know, what I I have to buy my material for, but anything that's left over goes into my fund for postage. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I do know that our post is post office is open and, uh, uh it's busy. So I, I know that, that, uh, the nice thing is, is that we can still can get mail out and, oh. and I'm sure that the people who are receiving your thoughtful gifts of masks and books are just, it just makes their day. Um, I know I have, uh, my sister made me a cat in a hat, uh, mm -hmm. a mask, which uh, matches my scrubs, which I wear on Dr. Seuss's birthday. And, but my mask, I get compliments on all the time. And then I get to tell people I'm a librarian and I wear my mask proudly because it always makes, I, you can tell underneath the, underneath the mask, somebody is smiling. I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping they're smiling. Oh, fantastic. So, you know, in your new role, as a virtual librarian, how have you been, and you've mentioned a little bit that you've been sending some things out to, to your school community. Um, how have you been supporting your, your middle schoolers and your, and your staff while we are, uh, learning and teaching, uh, remotely? Yeah, it's definitely been a bunch of shifts. And as I've seen, um, it's described as we're, we're pivoting, we're trying to figure out what our strengths are and how we can best help our communities. Um, and I got to say, one of the key factors that I feel has made me a successful virtual librarian is the team in which I find myself working with. And I have two amazing colleagues, Shannon McNeese and Dave St. Germain, and they are the other two middle school librarians in my district. And we have just really come together as a trio and we work together every morning. We start off with a Google Meet where we just kind of catch up and figure out our plan of action. And some of the things that we've done uh, collaboratively, I think, have been really successful in, in joining not only my, my middle school, Bristol Middle School, but all three middle schools across our town, which had been a little challenging to do when we were 
at school in real life because everything is so busy during the day, we didn't have a lot of time to connect. And some of the things that we really thought were a priority in the beginning, we really started with teachers and just helping teachers get acclimated to this new role that they also were finding themselves in. And all of the tech tools that some were really familiar with and some really were not familiar with. It was a, like we, like our learners, our students, there's a whole continuum of comfort and understanding. And so oh, so we so we started by re- just recording a few like little how-to videos and starting with Google Classroom and making sure everybody was set up and had their classrooms and how to organize them and some best practice strategies. Um, and then we kind of moved in a little bit of a role of leadership throughout the district. And our, our librarians in 612 now for the last probably eight weeks have really been working together closely with one another, as well as with some of the departments in our district. And the uh, language department supervisors had started doing some PD for their teachers who were asking on some training on specific tech tools they had been using. And they we saw what they were doing. And us three had just that week, right before spring break, the beginning of April, had started offering weekly PD sessions, just in time learning for our teachers that they could choose to sign up for. It wasn't required or mandated. It was just if they wanted to. And we saw that the the language department was doing the same thing. And so we joined forces. And now every Wednesday, we offer 10 to 12 sessions throughout that day that teachers can sign up and participate in. And it's just been amazing. So that's how we really started with the teachers. Wow. And, you know, I think how nice to have a team that you can uh, pull from because, you know, I I think what virtual learning and distance learning and uh, all of this has pointed out is that um, we are so IRL. We are so dependent on being physically Mm -hmm. in front of our students. And, And if we are in many cases, useful when we can teach the teachers. Well, who's teaching the librarians? Um, Have you found that you have had to self-teach, you know, do some of this on your, I know I'm scrambling. I I don't know how to do something. So I start trying to figure out the best way to to problem solve and teach myself so that when somebody calls me and says, hey, do you know how to do this? I'm like, actually, I think I figured out how to do it. Yes, I can help you. Oh my gosh, absolutely. That like all the time. And actually, this makes me think of one of the other roles that I play in my life is I am the vice president of our state library association. And we have really worked hard as an organization to bring librarians all throughout the state together to do just what you said, to train one another, to be there for support, because so many librarians find themselves as an island unto themselves in their school and or their district sometimes. And I think that that is something that I really, really hope for in the future, that school districts will continue to see the value that we can we can offer to a school and a district and a community. And there will be more of us in each place so that each one of us will have that network of, of guidance and of collaborative um, opportunity in where we find ourselves working. And I just think that one of my pieces of advice is to anybody out there listening, whether you're a classroom teacher or a librarian who has a team or is by yourself, find a network of people. And if that isn't something that you have in the system you find yourself in, you need to go and get on that computer. And we're all getting much better at that. (laughs) (laughs) And just find that network. I think that you mentioned a good point, because when I think about our state organizations, um, it's too easy to just sort of relegate. Um, our conferences to them mm-hmm. and say, you know what, I, I I rely on my state organization to run our our conferences, our um, those those sort of large scale again in real life uh, gatherings, and uh, and I'm very grateful they do because it's one it's the high point of my year is to get together with my state organization in Michigan and um, and and sadly that's going to be virtual as well this year. They 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 can already tell us that our state state conference will be uh, virtual. But you're right that looking to our state organizations to for for uh, additional support is is really good. And also we have a strong uh, county support, and mm-hmm. so in our in our county we do have uh, county librarians who pull together and do a lot of um, a lot of PD, and including organizing some uh, um, ed camps, which of course will have to be virtual as well. 
Yeah. yeah. All right. Fantastic. I I love to pivot to exactly what is sort of nice segue to working with your team on your live in the library uh, productions and friends. <laughs> I was so amused when I found this and, and because I follow Melissa, I, I saw I, it, it is really a different way to, um, to, to work with your students when you are some, some bitmojis and you can see these, these on, on YouTube, but please tell us about your, your collaboration with your, your middle school, uh, you know, cohort and your live in the library broadcasts. Yeah, so this has been one of my favorite things about everything that we've created, developed, um, I think. And we are going to be doing episode five. So this is week five into this adventure. And it um, it all started when we just were brainstorming and sort of lamenting about how we just felt so disconnected from our students and how we missed them. And, and they were so overwhelmed with all of this um, online learning that they were trying to figure out how to do and all these emails, you know, they're, they're not reading our emails right now because they get probably 40 of them in a day from Google Classroom notifications, right? So we just really wanted to find a way to connect with them and even beyond them, just the library community at large. And so we came up with this idea. We record about 15 to 20 minutes. We try to keep it pretty short, um, a weekly episode, uh, and we called it Live from the Library. We um, use a really cool platform called StreamYard that Dave had been using to do the morning news with students every day virtually and was having a lot of success. And what StreamYard does is you can have up to six people on the screen at once. You can share your screen. So we create um, a presentation every week with what we're going to share using Bitmojis. And I'll talk a little bit more about Bitmoji soon in a minute. Um, and when we go live, it goes on YouTube. So so all we need to do is share the link and anybody with the link can watch us and then it is recorded and it is available on a YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel I did add to the show notes. So you can check that out and see all the episodes we've done up to, to date as of when you're listening to this. Um, and we talk about a variety of things. We do, always talk about book mail and uh, we sometimes students send us pictures when they've received their their books. And those are the best pictures in my email each day when I get one of those. And so we get permission and we include that on there. We do a lot of book talks. Um, we have, we promote a specific author each week that we talk about a latest book. And uh, if they have recorded a Flipgrid book talk for our school on my author Flipgrid that I share with them, we, we share that on the show. We talk about enrichment activities and opportunities that we have found and where to find those for the students because people are just looking for high interest, engaging things to keep us busy. And that's what we really want to offer. We want to offer book talks and activities and just that connection where they know that we know that they miss us, we miss them. And there's just, there's ways to connect that aren't in real life, but can be almost as powerful. And we've had so much positive feedback from it. It's been great. Well, and I think the really exciting thing is that if you had tried to do live from the library solo, so like most, most people who take this on as a, as a standalone librarian themselves, that would have been all consuming. It wouldn't have been fun on some level. It would have become very overwhelming for you, but because you're teaming up with two other librarians who share the same age group, same passion, same, uh, you know, the readers are, are all the same age and you can work together. And it's sort of this, it's, it's not competitive. This isn't my collection versus your collection. This is, you know, all three of you recognizing that together, this is something that you can do that is spectacular and shared across all three uh, middle schools. I, I have to imagine that not only as colleagues and friends, your collaborative spirit when you work together with your other other schools has really given you um, some thoughts about what you could possibly do when we are beyond this uh, pandemic. But um, so I love that you are you're doing something that really only works best if you have several people working together. Um, 
And I, I also love because it's on YouTube, you get, you're going to get everyone, whether, you know, you know, I think sometimes synchronous teaching really while ambitious and fantastic and you're in the moment, the reality is most of us have lives, which we only can partially control. And so having the YouTube option and kids can come back and listen to it at their leisure and, and they hear your voices because that's what I've, the feedback I've been getting from parents, um, um, when they watch or, or a screencast is is the visual, but the voice as well, because it makes the kids feel connected to the person they know um, from the library. And so hearing hearing your voice being familiar to them or hearing my voice to my students um, really does help them connect, uh, certainly on an emotional level, because what they're listening to is being delivered by the person who should be talking to them in real life. So I'm really curious because I, I, I do follow you and, and you mentioned that you were going to have at least one uh, virtual author visit. And, and this is something that has to be easier than trying to uh, coordinate an author visit in real life. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. And um, the answer off the top is yes and no, as far as it being easier. And I'll tell you a little bit about why, why I say that. So the, the idea for virtual author visits, um, were, it's not new, obviously we do Skype visits and Google meet visits with authors as librarians, you know, regularly. And I had had two scheduled author visits that were supposed to happen way before all of this went down. And um, I had organized those because I found a post on Twitter by each of these authors, Dusty Bowling and Natalie Lloyd, two of my all-time favorite middle grade authors. And we had had dates on the calendar already. So when this all happened, I reached out and I just said, you know, are you still able and interested in doing our virtual visit? And I will figure out logistics of how that will look on my end. And they were very gracious and very happy to do it. Um, so we kept those two um, set up. And again, going back to my collaboration with my counterparts, Dave and Shannon, we kind of we decided, well, you know, let's try to make this a regular weekly thing and let's have it be something that uh, the students and the teachers and again, the greater community can just really count on uh, every Wednesday from 1130 to 12. We're going to try to have a virtual author visit. So we didn't know if that was feasible or not. So we just we started. And the reason that I say it's not it, it's easier. Yes. In the sense that you don't have to worry about some of the logistics that go into, say, scheduling when you are in real life at school, you have all sorts of schedules <laughs> that you have to figure out when is this author visit going to happen? Who's going to attend in the auditorium? Do we have to move timing around at all? Get, can the kids get out of class? All those things that we know go into a real life author visit. When you're virtual, and especially in a situation like this, Wednesday happens to be in our district a flex day. So students meet Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday on a schedule with Google Meets with their teachers all morning. Wednesday is a day that there's nothing officially scheduled for students or teachers, and it's a day that you can connect one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or do planning or whatever it is you choose to do. So that's why we chose Wednesdays. And the reason that is a little more challenging is when you think about netiquette and how do you engage and get engagement virtually, it can be a challenge. And I think that Anybody out there listening who has experienced distance learning, which I really am calling emergency learning, um, because this isn't what we're doing is not authentic, true distance learning. There's there's other factors that we haven't been able to do because there was no time. You just we just had to pick it up from one day to the next and just figure this out as we go. Um, but there's there's a lot of things that go into you know how. What, what's the etiquette for students and for the presenter? And how do we make sure that people are following those, those protocols? And how do we make sure that the, everybody on both ends are getting what they need? So that's been something that we've really kind of evolved in. And coming up next Wednesday will be our fourth visit. And I think we've made some really some big gains with that. But um, I want to say I want to give a shout out to the authors as well, that 
it's not, they have to do as much planning for virtual visits most of the time as they do for real life visits. Um, and there's a bit of a different dynamic, but the planning part that goes into it on the author's part is often the same amount of effort. Well, I guess I, I'm really intrigued because um, I, I, in the episode that came out in the beginning of this month with Jennifer Lewis, Skype in the library, she is working with elementary students. But when you have a Skype opportunity with your students, um, there is a great deal of, of when, like you said, when it comes to, in this case, this would be etiquette. Well, this would be netiquette because you're online with this, this uh, author, or in this case, the, whoever you're Skyping with, but those expectations are being hammered home from the beginning of the school year because you don't want uh, any, you don't want at any point to be embarrassed or to have your students uh, behave in a way that, that wouldn't uh, reflect well on your school. And yet, uh, do you have students contributing to this uh, uh, conversation with the author visit? We do, actually. We have, I think, what what works really well in a system. And what we do is it's a little bit more of an informal presentation so far. The first three have been authors talking about their books and um, kind of their process. And then we open it up actually to question and answer. And one of us three librarians will moderate the chat. We take turns. And as the the, um, the author is presenting, the students had been in, have been instructed at the beginning to write questions about what they want to know from the author. And it could, you know, we kind of set the parameters about their books, about their writing, about their, their choices about writing and all of those types of things. And then the moderator picks the questions as they come through, as we, we cut, we go in order, unless it's, you know, an an off task or not appropriate question. We read every question down, down and we say, so-and-so please turn on your, your mic. And we would love if you would ask your question. And the student gets to ask the question with their own voice they're on the camera and they get to see each other and it's so cool and it, it it's worked so well um I think that the only glitch we had that we remedied pretty fast is two weeks ago we actually started inviting fifth graders to our author events because we are missing out on the sixth graders co- or incoming sixth graders doing their tours at our school and getting to meet them in person and we wanted to find a way to connect with them before we, we return in whatever capacity we return in the fall. And so we had 70 people on our author visit with Jake Burt two weeks ago. It was insane. And there were a lot of just questions and, and comments in the chat that weren't applicable to the event. So that was when we decided we need to come up with some specific protocols and just, you know, set out that expectation because we can't assume that the students know. And I don't think that they're doing it maliciously. They just want to connect. They miss people and they want to talk to them in this chat. But we have to talk about what are the parameters of an author visit chat? What kind of things you put in and what kind of things do you not? So I think that's something that's been really cool that the kids love to be able to ask the author their own question. Well, and I I can agree because I I do teach fifth grade. I I teach K-5 and uh, I've been visiting a lot of fifth grade classrooms when they meet with their teachers and I've been given the, uh, well, Mrs. Herman's going to give us a library lesson for the first 15 minutes and and it's a lot of fun. But if you scroll through their, um, the, the conversations in the chat, oftentimes the teacher will just sort of step back and let the kids talk for a few minutes because there is this flurry of excitement, (laughs) but doing that in front of a guest author (laughs) and, 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 you know, it is, it is, I think the excitement of seeing one another, it it really is something that you're trying to channel in a way, but I, I do, I love this idea of bringing, um, authors and, and the ones you, I'll tell you what I, Ultimately, as somebody who recognizes middle grade is its own, like it, these aren't elementary uh, readers, these middle grade readers and the middle grade books, I have just now uh, been really expanding my own reading in middle grade. And I, I take so many suggestions from your book posse posts mm. because I, 
I, I know that you have vetted so many of these books and I, I, every single one's a fantastic read, but I, I think that bringing those fifth graders in acknowledges something that is very real. And that is next year is going to start very differently. And all the things that, that your incoming sixth graders used to be able to, to enjoy coming to your school and visiting it for the first time isn't happening. Right. Oh, well, so I, I really think I, I love this idea. I, I hope that listeners, uh, go and visit your, um, the links that you have shared with us because you have found a way to connect with students virtually and, and knowing that for many of us, especially schools, which resume late July, early August are going to be more virtual than in real life. I know those of us who will start in September, uh, we may have options that are different, but uh, let's, let's continue. Um, so your book talks will go into June. Is that correct? Yes. And actually, we are even talking about trying to continue throughout the summer and just offering those opportunities for readers who are really just excited and passionate. So that's something we're going to explore a little bit. But for now, we have three more all the way through the last Wednesday of our school year. Wow. And, you know, friends, the the other thing, too, is that recognize that while these these authors have livelihoods, which have been abruptly Mm -hmm. upturned because for so many of them, they would be at book signings, they would be at large, you know, school appearances, things that would drum up support for their for their titles. And all of that's off. It's off. It is. And that is that has been one of my also something that's been pulling on my heart. And one of the, the goals that I am that I have in the background of everything I'm doing related to culture of reading with my students and my teachers and my community. And just recognizing that. And um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure to work into this part of our conversation as well is that most of these authors have have generously and graciously offered this 15 to 30 minute Skype for no charge at all. And, and we, and we try to pay them a little bit. Most of us listening now, our budgets have been frozen. We don't have really readily accessible budgets until hopefully in the, in the summer when it resets. Um, But one of the ways that we are trying to just support and promote are getting books into the hands of kids, purchasing them from independent bookstores and promoting their titles and promoting the, the work that they're doing. And one of the, um, the things that the, the other two librarians and I just recently, we're going to actually submit it today, is a foundation grant that will bring in an author every month of our coming school year virtually, knowing that it's not going to probably have real life um, author visits for the foreseeable future. But we want to support the authors and we're writing a grant because that's one way we can fund it, where we will pay them for each visit. And we will promote it. And our students and our teachers then are guaranteed an experience with an author every month of the school year. Well, and I think that connecting with the author like that always makes reading the book that much more you know, relevant yes, and, and, and significant and say, Oh, I remember when we, we, we Skyped with that author, we Skyped. And, you know, I, I also, am I correct? This grant is being written on behalf of all three uh, middle yes. schools. Yes. Wow. I mean, so how could anybody possibly turn something <laughs> down? That's, you know, I mean, I, the, first of all, the optics of that are fantastic. And, and the, the reality is that the, again, it would be one thing if one of your schools was trying to do this because, but because you're sort of teaming up to do this, um, it really does demonstrate that you don't want to leave anybody out. Yes. And, and it really does. I, I, I really think that that shows a great deal of collaboration on the part of, of the librarians because you recognize that you're stronger together. Yes. Um, oh, I, I, yes. that's great. Um, <laughs> and, and also lot, you know, the authors have got to see, especially during this time of uh, distance learning and, and pandemic, that librarians really are allies in, in pushing their titles. They really see us as a, a very significant part of, of who is going to be buying and reading their books uh, because, you know, other librarians are following your lead. And when you post about the books you like, you know, other uh, librarians who follow you, you're part of my PR 
PLN. Um, I'm going to look at your recommendations and I, I, those are on my must read. I, I have a virtual uh, list of, uh, you know, my, my book list on my pile of my dresser is not there because it's virtual. I, it's you know, all, <laughs> yes. mostly all audio books. And um, so I, I really do appreciate what you're doing because it really does give me a, a window into what middle school libraries are, those are going to look like. Let's talk about your virtual book talks because your virtual book talks are those the ones that you're including in your live from the library. Um, yes, some of them, and I. Um, okay, so this is. <laughs> I haven't really talked about this whole process with anybody yet. It's relatively new, but I'm really excited about where it's going to go. Um, and I first want to give a shout out to Claire Landrigan. And I don't know if I'm saying her name correct. She's one of the authors from It's All About the Books, which is a really amazing um, professional development book that I highly recommend. Um, it's more geared towards K-5, but I took a lot away from it uh, when I read it last summer or maybe the summer before already. But she posted something at the beginning of all this about like virtual bookshelves and trying to get our students access to the resources that they were going to need for the long haul. Um, and so I took her idea and I started my own virtual bookshelf, my own virtual um, library on my school website, my school library website. And it's very much in beginning stages. But essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to promote our audio book and our ebook collection that we've always had, but we haven't had a large quantity of circulations. Um, but that's something we've been working on for the last year in a very like kind of concentrated um, manner. And that's another thing that we three librarians share. We share a paid subscription to Sora, which is the school version of Overdrive. And like you had said before, that is not something that I probably would be able to do very successfully on my own because it would probably be cost uh, prohibitive, but because we join as three, we split cost and we all benefit from the collection. So the virtual library idea really came from a combination of wanting to make sure kids and readers knew, both teachers and students, readers, that these titles were available. And we have quite a few in our collection within our school. But then in addition, so many generous companies have been opening up some of their collections for these months that we needed a way to make sure that readers knew about this and classroom teachers and how they could utilize these resources in the interim to help really bring their their learning and their teaching to a higher level. So, Well, can, can I ask you, because uh, first of all, I had I had a fun time last week. My middle school librarian said, hey, we've got about $500. And in our district, and this is a strange happening, but if people have been listening to the podcast, our fifth graders are migrating to the middle school. So our middle schools starting in the fall of this year will be fifth grade through eighth grade. So mm -hmm. um, because I've taught elementary and our fifth graders for 13 years, my middle school librarian said, hey, we've got $500. Could you buy books that your fifth graders love? Because <sighs> at four, Sora. Because our middle, oh, okay. we have a Sora, we have Sora for our K, K-12. And I had always purchased for elementary. And, mm -hmm. and so she came to me and said, yeah, how about $500 for, f you know, fifth grade, but even just dip it a little lower and put, bring in some fourth grade titles as well. Because when these kids go to the middle school, we want to make sure that all, uh, you know, our, our audiobooks and our eBooks have, you know, representation when they're looking at the middle school as well. And you mentioned about these companies. And I, I think this is a question mark that we have as well right now, because I think a lot of us know about ABDO opening up their, their collection. Capstone um, Junior Library Guild has about I, quite a few titles as well. And... Um, and Audible had made their yes. Audible made made their children's and tween and is it young adult as well? I think so. I think and, so. And Mackin also Mac, okay. um, a complete library of more nonfiction, which is interesting when you then talk about curriculum connections, right? And and 
I, I agree. When I've taught my, my, my lessons, they've all been in the interest of pushing access, student access to these audiobooks, student access to these ebooks. Um, you know, Sora, the, I, we have the Sora Sweet Reads, which has come yep. out and, um, the, um, it's the Audio Sync, which is the young mm, adult, yes. uh, which is for now. And, and then also broadcasting, which has been so exciting. Um, you know, Wizarding World did, uh, right. was doing all 17 chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, if you saw Taika Waititi, is collaborating with all the famous people who've been in his movies. And Taika is doing James and the Giant Peach, which I recognize ah, for okay. for uh, middle school might be a bit young. But if you appreciate, you know, Taika is bringing in Thor. Taika is, you know, Taika did Ragnarok. And so he brought in uh, Chris Hemsworth to do a oh. voice. Um, and he's bringing in Meryl Streep and, and Mindy Kaling. And so if you search on YouTube, I can put the link in there, um, you know, pushing those kinds of things out to my families. Yes. Um, so not just reading with our eyes, but reading with our ears, I guess, yeah. is the message that I've been sending. But the question is, are these generous, you know, Mackin and Abdo and Capstone and Junior Library Guild, are these still going to be available when we all go back to school? That's a great question. And the answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, but and also, like, how, they can't survive if they're giving away all their products. No, right? they can't. So I think we need to find a happy balance in between. Um, obviously, utilizing our public library collections that are digital are going to be there. They are there right now. One of the tools that we've been really promoting um, in the last, before this even happened, but especially since this happened is Hoopla, which is um, something that a lot of library systems subscribe to. And it's multi-user eBooks and audiobooks. It even has TV shows and movies. So there's other forms of media that it, it offers. And you only have to have a library card and you get so many checkouts per month. And they have a lot of titles. I mean, I do a lot of audiobooks in just in life in general. And I have been able to find probably 75% of what I've looked for has been available on Hoopla, which is amazing. Well, um, and Hoopla has oftentimes had the titles faster than yeah. the Overdrive slash Sora. So, you know, Hoopla has oftentimes, I go to them first. And uh, I think the other thing I appreciate with Hoopla is that they have a kid search. Yes. And so when I instruct my families on using Hoopla, I, I talk to my students, I'm saying, look, you know, you want the kid stuff to be put, you don't want to be weeding through the stuff your parents want to read or, mm -hmm. or watch or listen to. So click on the, the kid search and boy, their graphic novels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like it, it makes your collection expand exponentially yes. when you have access to this and kind of going a little bit back to my virtual library that this is where this conversation kind of started from. I am including the links to the Hoopla titles available to my students in, in that library system. Right. Because that is really part of our collection, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we the, the the collaboration between the school library and the public library is also something that I really want to advocate for in every situation. Well, and just in one 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 more word about Sora. When I was doing those titles, purchasing for fourth and fifth grade, um, even though our public library might also have a, a um, in overdrive, the li the the wait list for mm. the wait list mm -hmm. to get the overdrive copy is so much longer than our school account. And yep. so oftentimes, because I teach the kids how to link their two accounts, they can search both libraries at the same time. And they can see that the public library's copies, there are long wait lists, yes. but they go through our school account. And, uh, you know, I do see a lot of teachers or school librarians asking, should I invest in Sora? Should I invest in Sora? My goodness, our, our use, our, 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 uh, statistics that we've been collecting ever since this has all justified this investment. Um, and it was very gratifying to see that when you spend money on a digital resource, it's being used. Absolutely. And actually, that makes me think of too, I am definitely a proponent of getting Sora. If you have a budget that you can, um, you have access to a budget, it's well worth the investment. And also, uh, we talked a lot about that on a webinar I did with School Library Connection earlier this spring on digital collections. And 
as a result of planning for that webinar, I was able to really go into Overdrive's resources that they have available for both marketing and, and all these different things. Oh my gosh, there are so many tools as a librarian that I have access to through the Overdrive resource page that it's amazing, like just for promotion and, and getting the word out about your collection and just different resources. So Absolutely. Check that out too. You mentioned something about Bitmojis, and because oh. <laughs> Bitmojis uh, fare uh, very prominently in your Live from the Library, I would love for you to to share with us some of your what you have learned about Bitmojis while we are uh, talking about our virtual presence and how we connect with our, our audience. Yeah, so um, the newest craze that we have been up, we've been obsessed with Shannon, Dave, and I. Um, it is just taking your Bitmoji that a lot of people have and creating Bitmoji scenes. So I actually, in the show notes, have included just um, a resource page that I've just been curating for different tools of how to do Bitmoji scenes and just some tips of the trade that I've learned as I've as I've gone through this. And I also did a PD for the staff. We had kind of a fun PD where teachers were just really wanting to know a little bit more and kind of be guided through how to start with Bitmoji scenes. So I've included that that recording as well, if anybody's interested in, in watching a basic Bitmoji 101. But what we do is that's the, we create a presentation in Google Slides and we pop, we put a background in and we can decide what scene we want to have, what kind of room we want to be in. And we just drop our Bitmojis into the slide, depending on what we're talking about. So for our book mail slide, we always have one of us coming out of the mailbox. We find the Bitmoji that we're coming out of the mailbox. Um, when we had Dusty Bowling featured last week on our show, we were behind the cactus. <laughs> we had to tweak it a little bit because the person, the my Bitmoji face was sad and Dusty Bowling makes me super happy. So we had to do a little editing and, and uh, kind of Frankenstein um, my Bitmoji with a happy face onto the the sad face. Um, but and we hyperlink it. So they they become dynamic, interactive tools to use with your students. And students love talking and looking at at bitmojis of their teachers and their librarians. And if you've listened to the first episode that I recorded with you, um, we talked a little bit about how I had the staff share their bitmoji with me. And I created a bulletin board that had all of their bitmojis with the book. And students had to try to figure out which bitmoji belonged to which teacher in our school. And so it's kind of an evolution taking it virtual now and it's creating an interactive scene with whatever you want. And just be warned, once you start getting into this, you are going to go down the rabbit hole and you are going to become obsessed. Um, and I like dream, I'm not even kidding. I dream about different scenes that I could create. And one of my, <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, I, I really, I, I see this. Um, I've seen examples that teachers have done. I've seen examples that librarians have done. They really draw the user in and mm -hmm. it is interactive and you, yes. you can, the kids can click on the book covers and they can either go to an audio reading or, or, uh, you know, uh, a, a YouTube or, you know, whatever resource you're going to be sending it out. And it, it really has been a really entertaining way to engage with the kids. Oh my gosh. And can I just tell you that um, some sometimes this whole situation just becomes a little too much for me personally, and I'm sure other people experience moments of that. And that happens, you know, kind of on an ebb and flow basis. And I will never forget that like three weeks ago, Shannon, Dave, and I, we plan our Live from the Library episode every Monday for Tuesday. And there was some, we had just gotten some really, I don't know, some news that had come in that we were a little stressed about. And we, we were just kind of in a funk as far as our moods. And we started creating collaboratively our Bitmoji scenes for the, the next episode. And it completely changes your mood. Like we were laughing and joking and having so much fun and being silly and a little ridiculous at times. Um, but it's just, it's like good for the soul. And we talk about that now every time we get together, you know, no matter how stressed we feel or bogged down by what we know we have to do or what we're not able to do right now, it really has been therapeutic, I think, for us. And I just, anybody who has not really seen this or heard of it, 
please check it out and just give yourself a little self therapy because <laughs> it will it will help i promise <laughs> Well, and and it is it's a, a distraction, but it's one in which we can really channel the yes. what we value and the messaging that we want to get across to our students can be done in a way that we know will be very engaging for our students. Yes. Oh, and can I just add one more last thing? Uh, yeah, so- this is your episode. Do you get to <laughs> yeah, absolutely take it away? Well, one of the um, the cool tools that you learn about when you start doing Bitmoji is there's a website that it's called, I think, remove.bg, and um, it'll be in the notes, and it's on my Bitmoji page. But you can put any image. Um, so I take a picture of my cat, Olga, who is like my she's my mascot. She's 22 pounds. She's amazing. She loves to read. And she, I put her picture in there. It takes the background all the way out. So it's just Olga and I can put Olga in my scene. So we've been able to really share parts of ourselves with our viewers because each one of us has different images. It's kind of like Easter eggs. We put them in our slides so that people can try to find them. Um, and that that's just been so cool to kind of just think about what represents me and what I want people to see. And I can see so many applications that we could utilize with that type of learning with students in the fall when we're going to have to try to figure out different ways of connecting that aren't always in real life. Well, and I love it because it's virtual, but you're building relationships. Yes. And it it does. And we know how click happy our kids can get. And it doesn't matter how old they are. They're going to be clicking on everything. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, and then the idea of having students create their own Bitmoji, uh, worlds and they could create their own virtual bookshelves, and yes, I, I really, this, this, this has got so much potential. I love the resources. I'm looking at them right now. Friends, um, Melissa has been very generous. She's also included a lot of hashtags we can follow and, uh, and also the, uh, the not only the, the Bitmoji scenes, but also other, other links, which have been included in our, our earlier episode. Melissa, I can't thank you enough for sharing all of your expertise and especially because there we all know that the beginning of next year is going to have virtual components to it, regardless if you start school in July or in August or like me in September. I, I can't thank you enough for for being here and making sure that we feel empowered to move forward in this virtual uh, library space that we occupy right now. Thank you very much. And I just want like last closing thought, I think, is that we are all in this together and find your network, find your people. um, And we have to find the joy and the things that bring us joy in this really challenging time, because there's a lot that we're all dealing with and we all have our own things. But I think when we focus on positive and we come together as a virtual community we're just all better together. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Please, anybody listening, I'm available. Go to my website, find me on Twitter, uh, find me on Facebook. And I love collaborating. And I am so happy to connect with people from everywhere. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Melissa. I know this is not the last time we will talk. (laughs) Yay! I hope not. I'm so grateful that Melissa could spend some time with us sharing some suggestions on how we can promote a virtual culture of reading with our students. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. The topic of our next episode will be virtual job interviews and my interview with Courtney Pentland. I hope you will tune in.